So, um, Mr. Sam Vaknin, uh, uh, I'm very glad to meet you again, to talk with you again. Thank Unfortunately, you. in uh, this is happening in a very bad circumstances. Uh, this war that started on Saturday in Israel um, uh, is, is a very, very bad thing for Israel, for Palestinians, I think, and uh, for the whole world. Uh, because we saw a lot of images with uh, civilians killed, uh, tortured, and uh, and these kind of images, I, I hope that someday uh, we will put an end to all of the wars. Please tell me what's your opinion about what's happening there in, uh, in Gaza, in Israel. First of all, it's important to understand that Hamas has used all its assets. Hamas will not be able to launch a similar attack in the next 20 years, maybe. It is using everything it has, 1,000 fighters, thousands of rockets, all the assets that it had. It's one desperate last ditch throw of the dice. It's a make or break for Hamas. Why did Hamas speculate this way? Why is it risking its own existence? For two reasons, I think. Number one, the popularity of Hamas in the Gaza Strip, let alone in the West Bank, was going down dramatically because of corruption of Hamas officials, lack of proper governance, inability to produce results and to take care of the economy, uh, clashes between the Hamas and other factions of Palestinian politics, and so on and so forth. Hamas was losing in popularity and it needed to restore its popularity and its credentials as the organization that is fighting Israeli occupation. The one group of Palestinians who never compromise and will get things done, will obtain the results. The second reason is even more important. Israel was reconciling with other Arab countries, Morocco and so on. Lately, there has been discussion of a normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Now, Saudi Arabia is not just any Arab country. It's the keeper of the holy shrines of Islam. It is the core of Islam. And here is Saudi Arabia, willing to accept the existence of Israel, willing to establish normal diplomatic and economic relations with Israel. And all this normalization process, which started basically with Donald Trump, actually, all this normalization process is at the expense of Palestinians. The agenda of the Palestinians, the interest of the Palestinians, the pain of the Palestinians is being overlooked and ignored as if the Palestinians no longer exist, as if there's only Israel and the rest of the Arab world and the Palestinians are dispensable. Hamas needed to put the Palestinians back on the map as the main item of the agenda in the Middle East, in the Arab countries, in the Muslim world, and in the United States. Yeah, but it's a map of blood. There's no other way Hamas map, reached the map, Hamas. Yeah, it's a map of blood of innocent civilians. Yes, Hamas and, and the Palestinians you, have reached the conclusions conclusion long time ago. Yeah. That the only way to attract the world's attention in a rapid news cycle and with numerous wars and terrorist attacks and social media and TikTok and other what the only way to attract attention is to kill innocent civilians. It is unfortunate, but it is true, actually. Now, the war between Israel and the Palestinians goes back to 1882. 1882, that's almost 150 years. The problem is that there is no solution to this conflict. That's the truth. Because the claims of the two peoples are mutually exclusive. Both of them are competing for the same tiny piece of land. It's a tiny piece of land. 
Both of them are competing for a tiny piece of land. Both of them claim total ownership of that piece of land. And both of them have a sacrificial mindset. They're willing to sacrifice themselves. Suicide is a common tactic in this kind of war. Also on the Israeli side, the Israelis are raised on the Masada myth, the myth of Masada, where Israelis committed, uh, Jews committed suicide when the Romans tried to take over the fortress of Masada. Suicide is in the genes, in the cultural genes of both Palestinians and Israelis. So, and there is no distinction between civilians and military. Because in Israel, there is no standing army. There is there are only 70,000 or 100,000 soldiers, which are professional soldiers. All the rest, about another million, are actually civilians, the reserves. So Hamas doesn't make a distinction between a man who is wearing civilian clothes and a man who is in uniform. That man can become the next minute a soldier. Yeah, but a child... Children, this is a total warfare. It's like asking, it's like asking uh, the British Air Force, why did you bomb Dresden and kill hundreds of thousands of civilians? You know, we are dealing with total warfare. It's asymmetric warfare. Asymmetric warfare involves civilians as active bargaining chips. That has been the case all over the world. Collateral damage, in the words of American tactic, and, and so on and so forth. I am not condoning the killing of civilians. But when you are dealing with a situation of two populations which are intertwined, occupy the same territory, work with each other, because something like 60,000 people from Gaza work every day inside Israel, in its economy. So you can't really separate you can't say okay you know you're going to target only soldiers it's unrealistic it's unrealistic everyone is the front line everyone is on the front line what do you think that uh, might be the response of the let's say civilized world so democratic countries because there were uh, many statements in the last uh, 30 35 hours of uh, condemning this attack of Hamas from United States, European countries, and other democracies. Uh, what should they do more than just statements? Because you said that th there is no solution, but we have to do something. This is a proxy war, perhaps a little like Ukraine, a little like Ukraine. This is a proxy war between Iran and similar powers, including China, including Russia, and the West. Iran is the main funder of Hezbollah in Lebanon, and one of the main funders of Hamas, not, not the only one, but also. So Hamas and Hezbollah are long arms of Iran and allies of Iran. This is a proxy war taking place on Israeli territory between West and the enemies of the West. And similar proxy wars are now taking place in Ukraine and are going to erupt everywhere because the West is declining. The West is declining and is going to try to preserve its superiority and hegemony by fighting. So Israel is a society that is ostensibly democratic is allied with the West, definitely, especially the United States. You saw Biden's, Biden's knee-jerk automatic reaction. So Israel is a standby for the West. It represents the West in that region. And so it's a colonial outpost in the view of Marxists. Now, there are Marxists everywhere. There are Marxists in Kosovo, where another proxy war is about to take place between Serbia and Kosovo. There are proxy wars everywhere. So you see, you, you think that uh, in the near future, or in the near future, or on the medium or long term, uh, we have to expect to many other conflicts or to some conflicts to intensify. 
wherever the there are fault lines, wherever there are fault lines between the declining West, which includes the European Union and the United States, and the emerging superpowers, such as China, uh, such as uh, non-aligned countries, India, and uh, BRICS, the new expanded BRICS, wherever there's fault lines between these two, between these, you know, body politics, we're going to see similar conflicts, yes. But with Israel, there's another problem. Israel is no longer a consensus country. There's no longer consensus. There, there are huge debates within Israeli society about values, about identity, about religion, about judicial reform, about democracy. There is no agreement now. There is no glue that holds Israeli society together. It is very vulnerable and fragile. And a blow like what Hamas has done can rupture Israeli society, can fragment it. This is a major threat to the world because if Israeli society should be fragmented, if there will be a slow motion simmering civil war in Israel, which I think is exactly what's going to happen soon, then the more extreme elements in Israel are going to abuse Israeli power and project it, for example, to Iran in rogue actions. I am very worried about Israel becoming a rogue state. Civil war between whom? Between civil war between Israel left and right, or... left and right, religious and secular, and so on and so forth. But between Israeli yes. citizens. Yes, civil war between Israelis and Israelis. <laughs> but now under this threat of uh Short -term. maybe the survival No, on the very contrary. This threat will exacerbate the tensions and the friction. This threat is exactly what will break Israel apart. You will see shortly, after a short period, there will be a short period, you know, Israel will invade Gaza. Israel will bombard Gaza. Israel will recapture Gaza. Israel will eradicate the Hamas and kill thousands of people. I have no doubt about this. And in this short term, everyone will be together, unified. Then there will be a reckoning. How come there was such an intelligence failure? How come the Israeli Defense Forces failed to mobilize? In this reckoning, they will start a civil war in Israel be between left and right. I'll give you one fact. The reason the Israeli Defense Forces were unable to stop the Hamas from, from entering Israel is because all the forces of the Israeli Defense were in the West Bank, protecting, yeah. protecting settlers under the direct instructions of Benjamin Netanyahu, a criminal, an indicted criminal in Israel. The state has been hijacked by the mob. It's an ochlocracy. Additionally, there are enormous economic tensions in Israel. There's huge income inequality. Cost of living is stratospheric. No one can survive. Israel is no longer a sustainable proposition. And I think the I think I'm convinced that it will end in internal war, internal civil war, civil war. But then my huge fear is that Israel will go rogue and will use its considerable power, nuclear weapons included, to kind of externalize the pressure. Say, okay, we are under attack, we are under threat, let us forget our civil war, let's unite. Attacking Iran, for example, could be a great recipe for reunification. Yeah, but this uh, might mean um, a, a kind of involvement of other Arab countries, because if uh, Israel is, a, is an enemy for many uh, Arab countries. Iran is not an Arab country. Iran is an enemy of most Arab countries. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, let me rephrase, uh, Muslim country, countries. No, no, that's a myth. The worst enemies of Muslims are Muslims. More Muslims have been killed by Muslims than by any other religion. 
If you attack Iran, your automatic friend of Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Gulf states, and so on, automatic friend. Mm -hmm. So Israel, of course, will target very cleverly and wisely, but it would still be rogue operations with enormous potential for, for escalation, which will engulf the whole world in flames. The, the danger cannot be overestimated. People think this is a local conflict. It's not. Can you uh, give me more details? How can you see this possible escalation? Um, who do you think that might be involved in an escalation that um, might be very dangerous for the whole uh, world? It's a one to three situation. Israel will invade Gaza. Iran will support Hamas. Hezbollah will be instructed by Iran to attack Israel. Israel will attack Hezbollah. Syria will be involved. It will spread. Russia may get involved. On the which is, side? Which, how? On, how on, on the Arab side, because Russia is no longer Israel's friend. Yeah. So Russia may be dragged into this. At, at the minimum, Iran will be dragged into this. Then Israel will retaliate against Iran. Iran is on the border with Afghanistan, with Russia, with, you know, it's too close for comfort. This way may drag Central Asia into the picture, Turkey into the picture. Definitely, we are looking at a serious potential for international conflagration. Serious potential. I don't think I'm exaggerating, and I don't think it's hyperbole. Last time when we talk, we talk about... Um... Ukraine. This conflict in Israel, if uh, it will escalate, if if it will not be stopped soon, uh, if it will escalate, uh, this will uh, be in favor of Putin regarding the war of Ukraine. Of course. How do you see this? Well, that's precisely the reason why I mentioned that Russia may be dragged in. Because it's one hell of a way of, for Russia to divert attention from the crisis in Ukraine and to fight the West by proxy. Russia would have a vested interest. China already make, made noises in support of Hamas, which is a bit unusual even for China. So now China and Russia and, you know, and other BRICS members, they begin to consider themselves as an alternative to the West. I'm telling you, this is not a local conflict. It appears to be a local conflict. It's not. Hamas would have never attacked Israel. Never. In a million years. Had it not been guaranteed to have support from outside forces, such as Iran. Possibly Russia as well, but definitely Iran. Something is going on here, which is much bigger than you know, 600 dead Israelis. Uh, looking at the media and the debates that uh, were started yesterday and, uh, and today about uh, the attack of Hamas, um, I saw an information I, I, uh, that uh, because it was a question how Hamas was so well prepared because it was a very coordinated plan. They had a lot of rockets, a lot of missiles and um, uh, I saw an information that somehow there are some tunnels between Egypt and Gaza, and maybe uh, through these tunnels, Hamas received a lot of munition, ammunition and a lot of uh, missiles and a lot of uh, um, uh, weapons that are used now. Do you see that, do you think that Egypt also might be involved or Egypt somehow is involved in this attack? Not Egypt as a country, but definitely elements in the Egyptian military and especially Egyptian border police and police. They are collaborating with the Palestinians. Only because Gaza, Gaza is very well surrounded by yeah. the Israeli forces. It's yes. not so easy to bring to Gaza missiles or other... Although, although there's been a major intelligence failure uh, for example, the Hamas has acquired special boats and special paragliders, military paragliders, and even drones. 
And Israel was not aware of this. Yeah. Which is shocking. It's absolutely shocking. And they didn't buy only one boat. Israel has already intercepted seven boats. Now, these boats are in the international market, it's true, but there are not too many sellers of military boats. <laughs> you know, they're like, you know, I don't know. Israel should have been aware that the Hamas is buying military boats in commercial quantities, you know. And they, there's a massive intelligence failure here. Um, yesterday, an Egyptian policeman shot two Israeli tourists and a local Egyptian guy. There are elements in Egypt's in Egypt that are supportive of the of the Hamas and the Palestinians, and they they are supportive not because they support the Palestinians. They hold the Palestinians in contempt. I can tell you this, but. They're supportive because they want to annex Gaza. They regard Gaza as an Egyptian territory, which has been kind of occupied by Israel unfairly. And they don't think that Gaza should belong to the Palestinians. They think it's an Egyptian territory. So, but, you know, my enemy's enemy is, is my friend. My, my, uh, yeah. so, so that's why they are, they are friends. But, uh, I don't think Egypt is the, is the key player here and or the main threat here. I I think it it has the potential to become a proxy war between east and west involving all the major players. Because Ukraine with all due respect is a very important country but it does not have the centrality of Israel. Israel is much smaller much smaller country, tiny compared to Ukraine, but much more important in Ukraine. For the US and for Europe and for the world. For US, for Europe, for oil, oil interests, for much more important in Ukraine, much more strategically critical than Ukraine. Ukraine can vanish off the map and it would be very lamentable, but I don't think anyone in Europe would notice. However, if Israel were to conflict with all its neighbors, up to Iran and Turkey, involving Russia and I don't know what, the whole world will notice, starting at the gas pump. It's a strategic location, always has been for thousands of years. Roman Empire, Roman Empire dedicated a huge part of its force to tiny Palestine, the Sixth Legion, and you know, amazing. About one third of the Roman army was in tiny Palestine, tiny unnoticeable in the maps and Rome controlled everything from India to Britain and yet one third of its army was in, in Palestine. And why um, why do you think that uh, um, uh, an escalation in Israel will affect the pipelines, the oil issue? Because because Oil is the only leverage left on both East and West. As far as the East is concerned, for example, Russia. Russia is leveraging its energy assets uh, in a variety of ways, trying to deny them to Europe, trying to, to sell them at a discount to China and other places in order to create an addiction to Russian oil. Similarly, the Europe is trying to win itself of dependency on Russian oil by developing alternative sources and so on. Similarly, many locations in the West, including Israel, are producing oil now. Israel is a net oil exporter now. The United States is one of the biggest producers of oil in the world. So oil is, is, is still a, a major currency, major coin in international affairs. And so Israel is, is at the crossroads of all these interests. It controls important sea lanes. It controls access to many oil producing territories. It's, it's, a, staging, it's a staging ground, uh, could be a staging ground and, and so on and so forth. I don't think it's only oil though. Oil is one element. But I think Israel is on the way, for example, to Asia. Exactly like Turkey. Turkey has the same position. 
these are gateways to, to Asia. For example, if you want to transition from Asia to Africa, you need to go through Israel. So this is why Israel is much more important than Ukraine, for example. And the, con the very limited conflict in Israel is much more worrying and terrifying than the all-out war in Ukraine. And there is also the, let's say, the religion factor. Yes, of course, there's history, the symbolism, there are cultural elements. There is a lot of baggage that goes with this ostensibly geopolitical conflict. It's not merely a geopolitical conflict. The whole thing started with Al-Aqsa, the mosque in, in, the, in Jerusalem. The attack of Hamas on Israel is, was, call, was called the Al-Aqsa flood. Hamas said that it is attacking Israel because too many Israeli tourists and visitors are trampling on the sacred grounds of Al-Aqsa. The, the pretext, the excuse, was religious. But there are still many, many people, perhaps a majority of people, who are motivated by such, may I say, nonsense. You know. They they still can be aggravated and become suicidal if con if they are confronted with some religious infraction or some religious transgression. And it's not only religion, because I think one thing that the West does not understand, and the East does not understand, is that Judaism is not only a religion; it's a nationality. There. Uh, Islam is the same. Islam is not only a religion. It's a nationality. It's called Ummah. Ummah means nation. So these particular religions are not only, they don't only possess the power of religion. They possess the power of the nation state. They are also cultural spheres. So it's a clash of civilization. Huntington was right. It's not a clash of religions, because we have had clashes of religion. For example, we have the Crusades, Christianity against Islam, and so on. That's not the same here. It's total in the sense that it's a clash of national interests, cultural spheres, and religion. When Judaism is fighting Islam, it's a fight about the definition of the world in every possible way culturally, socially, religiously, nationally, you name it. No element is left. You know when compromise is possible in international affairs? When there are elements where you can be in agreement with your enemy. If you have something in common with your enemy, you can make peace. The Germans and the French had something in common, European identity, European culture, they had something in common. They had a clash about nationalist interests, the German Lebensraum, and so on. Yeah, there was a clash about nationalism, but there was no clash about culture. There was no clash about civilization. There was a cl clash about music. Mozart was very popular in France, you know. They had a lot in common. But the Jews and the Muslims have nothing in common. Nothing in principle in common. They are the the fight, the conflict cuts across every possible dimension. So there is no ground for compromise or divorce or consensus. So you think that uh, in the next century we we might have the same problems. It is a perpetual conflict. Yeah. Also because also because the elites have a vested interest in keeping the conflict alive, of course. There's a lot of money, there's a lot of political support for the conflict, and so on. Yeah, but I think that even the political elites or political leaders, or if they will see a, a solution, a kind of a solution, there will be at least some of the political leaders, maybe not all, but at least some of them will embrace the efforts and the goal to to get a, a, a deal, to get a compromise, because remember the 90s. In the 90s, it was a kind of a peace, let's say, uh, and it was the Nobel Award for Peace were given to the 
uh, Israeli Prime Minister and uh, Yasser Arafat, who was the leader of the Palestinian movement. Uh, okay, so there were some tryings and there were some steps, but uh, they were just for a short time. I wouldn't say they were for a short time because you had the Oslo Accords, then you had the Ehud Barak's program and so on and so forth. It wasn't a question of time. It was the discovery during this process of reconciliation and attempted peace. It was the discovery that you they have nothing in common. So they compromised on everything and then everything fell apart because of Jerusalem. Why? Because Jerusalem represented religion the Al-Aqsa Mosque and so on. You can compromise about nine out of 10 things and the last element will destroy everything because you need common ground. There is no common ground between Israelis, Jews, and Muslims, Arabs, none. No common ground. So we so, have eternal war. Yes, Hamas is right about this. Hamas says one of us has to go. And it should be the, the Israel. Israel Israel should be eliminated, destroyed. They are right about this, not because I think it's a good thing to say, but they are right in identifying the core problem. It's a mutually exclusive proposition. It's we or they. It's Israelis or Arabs, not a combination. Core. Israel can make peace with Morocco. Israel can peace, make peace with Saudi Arabia, of course. Israel can make peace even with Lebanon, even with Syria. There's no problem there. There's no real problem there. There's no competition for the same thing. But when it comes to the territory of the state of Israel, it's a mutually exclusive proposition. One of the two peoples have to give up or go or be exterminated or be cleansed. The solutions are not good. Now, Serbia went through an identical situation with Kosovo, of course. Kosovo was majority Albanian, although historically it was majority Serb. But it was majority Albanian and so on and so forth. And Kosovo finally became an independent state, not recognized by the majority of nations, by the way, but still an independent state. And look what's happening. What is happening? The Serbs are not accepting it. They're not accepting it. Kosovo is exactly in the same situation as Israel. And Armenia and Azerbaijan is also... Uh... Armenia and Azerbaijan is a different story because in Azerbaijan there was an enclave yeah. of Armenians. There yeah. was no really... There wasn't really... For example, Kosovo is where Serbianism yeah, but... started. You know, Kosovo is the history of Serbia in 1389. The, you know, it's the history of Serbia. Same with Palestine. It's, it's history, it's identity, it's... In short, yeah. yeah, but I mean, in in uh, the Armenians from Azerbaijan were forced to leave. Yes, as you said, as you exactly, said, exactly. Yes, yes. Was a, a kind of and, a and, and the situation there was not so bad, not yeah. as bad as Israel, because Nagorno Karabakh is not an integral part of Armenian identity. Kosovo is an integral part of Serbian identity. Jerusalem is an integral part of Jewish identity and Muslim identity. It's not the same thing. And even though the level of conflict, the intensity of the conflict in Azerbaijan was much lower than Jerusalem and Kosovo, still the solution was removal of the, of the other. It's about removal of the other. I know it's politically incorrect. I know you don't talk about these things, ethnic cleansing and so on and so forth, but this is no, what no good think. news. No good news inside. Not if you're looking for a mutual accommodation within a two state solution and so on. This is a pipe dream. It's nonsensical. It's a total Even the two state solution is total a, pipe an dream. illusion. Total illusions, typical Western delusions. Typical Western delusion. So you see that it will be a total war between Palestinians and uh, uh, Israelis. Well, it could become a one-state solution, a multicultural, multi-ethnic state, 
that strangely is much more likely than two state solution. It could be something like this because Israelis, Israeli, the concept of, of an Israeli is artificial. Israelis are Jews that came from 138 countries. So they are used to the other. They're used to the concept of other. They are Jews from Germany and Jews from Yemen and Jews from Egypt and Jews from Morocco. And they all, they all become Israelis. And from so Romania. Not, yeah. yeah, in Romania even. So why not, be, why not an Arab to become an Israeli? It's no problem there. I think a one-state solution is much more likely than a two-state solution in the long term. I think ultimately this is what will have to be because there's no other solution. But a two-state solution... State, hmm? Yeah, but this one-state solution will uh, um, mean that the, the, the Palestinians will accept and they, at least some of them, most of them, are are not willing now to accept this. No, actually, the Palestinians are all for one a one state solution because they think they are the majority. So, yeah, but they want a Palestinian state, not an Israeli state. Yes, the the Palestinians say we accept a one state solution if we maintain democracy, and via democracy we become the majority and we control the country. The Israelis have in mind something very similar to apartheid in South Africa. We may become a one-state solution, but Israel, the Jews will be in control all the time, and the Palestinians will do the construction work. There so will be a second, second kind class of citizen. citizens. Uh, yes, uh, second class citizens. Second. Apartheid. The, and so the, what's left is two-state solution. But if you look at the geography, a two-state solution is undoable, unsustainable, total nonsense. How do you connect the West Bank to Gaza? It's utter delusion. So three it's states, stupid. three states solution. It's I don't three know many states state solution. It's you yeah. need topology. You know I'm I'm a mathematical physicist. You need topology. Topology is the ultimate in mathematics to divide spaces and areas. It's it's nonsense. It's really nonsense. And any such attempt, because there have been such attempts in European history, for example, Kaliningrad. Kaliningrad in Poland and so on. There have been such attempts to maintain enclaves connected via transport corridors to bigger entities like Russia. These attempts are now proving to be disastrous because the Ukraine war, for example, is, is exactly because of this. It's exactly because of trying to uh, square the circle. Ukraine is a two-state solution. Ukraine is a two-state solution because the Russians consider Ukrainians to be Russians. They consider them to be Russians. And the Ukrainians, you know, they consider themselves as, as the, the beginning of, 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 of the whole thing. So at some point in the 60s, they created essentially a two-state solution where the Ukrainians had Ukraine and the Russians had Russia, but they were, like in 1917, they were incorporated in a confederation and they got, uh, Crimea became Ukrainian and, you know, it was a two-state solution. And now Putin is trying to put an end to it. You cannot look at history over the period of 10 years or 70 years. That's not history, that is news. You look at history, you look over 1,000 years. You start with the key of principality. You start with the key of principality and you see suddenly that over 1,000 years, the Russians and the Ukrainians were always at war about identity. Am I Russian? Am I Ukrainian? What is Ukrainian? What is Russian? What, you know, it, there was always a question of, like, of and, and so all the all the all the territorial divisions, sometimes with Poland, sometimes with you know, all these territorial divisions never worked. The two-state solution has been tried multiple times. It's not an invention of Israelis and Palestinians. It's usually an exceedingly bad solution. One-state solutions happen. I can show you quite a few one-state solutions, which are 
Malaysia, for example, you know, which are pretty successful, one-state solutions. I may be the only successful two-state solution, and it is not really very successful, is India and Pakistan. And it's not really successful. There's been five wars until now. Five. Yeah, and next both one countries we... sorry? Gone. and both countries gone uh, nu nuclear. They they have yes. nuclear. And the next one the next two... one because next they one are may be nuclear. Yeah. yeah. Next one may be nuclear. Absolutely. Another another attempt at two state solution was the civil war in the United States. It was an attempt at a two state solution. No, wasn't it? The Confederacy yeah. and the Union. Yes, yes, yes. It did work very well. So we need to learn from history. Yeah, but in the same time, Ukrainians will never accept to be included in a Russian state, let's of say. Course. Of course. Um, As Palestinians will, will never be happy to be part of an Israeli state. But Ukrainians will not agree to be part of a Russian state because it's controlled by Russia. Yeah, but... Do you see in any point in, in the future, let's say, do you think that it is possible for humanity, for uh, all of the nations to embrace the wisdom of peace and to let away these divisions, these misunderstandings, these conflicts though, based on religion, nationality, culture, history, and so on? Do you think that it is possible or the humanity is doomed to do wars in the far future, maybe we will colonize Mars and Moon, and there will be also there some wars between the colonists from India and colonists from US or China or Russia, or I don't know. Well, first of all, I'm a little more optimistic about this because we have agreed that in some parts of the universe, uh, there's not gonna be war and there hasn't been war. For example, Antarctica. Antarctica is a very rich continent with enormous mineral wealth, wealth, and Antarctica is in control of important sea lanes. And Antarctica has not been subjected to any war. No one, no one attacked anyone in Antarctica. By the way, it's a giant continent. No one attacked anyone in Antarctica. So similarly, the moon, Mars, I'm not kidding you. I'm serious about this. These are territories. And yet we haven't seen any space war between Russia and the United States over the moon or Mars. This teaches us that it is possible to reach an accommodation, a peaceful accommodation between powers and even superpowers regarding specific territories. The problem is never territory. The problem is the symbolic sphere. We are fighting over symbols because we are, we are creatures of dreams. We are storytellers. We die for fiction. We never die for reality. You die for the nation state. What the hell is a nation state? It's nonsense. It's a story. You die for a piece of cloth known as the flag. What the hell is a flag? And yet you die for it. We die for symbols. We never die for reality. And in Antarctica, it was a virgin territory, so there were no symbols there. There was no heritage. There was no culture. There was no religion. No past. When we are embedded in the present and with an outlook to the future, we collaborate very well as a species. Another example is Australia. Australia is a continent, you know. I, did, I didn't see China invading Australia in order to counter the British Empire. Or, you know, I didn't see war there. There's no war there. Why? Because Australia has no history. There's no past. I know Australians will be very angry at this, but that's the truth. They are, it's a totally present society. There's no past. When we don't have a past, we, know, we don't fight. We collaborate, actually. We have many examples of collaboration. Peaceful. Totally peaceful. Another example is science. We collaborate in science. There's no war in science, no conflicts in science. Well, not of this kind, not with aggression and violence, you know. International Space Station. Yes, 
we are capable as a species of peaceful collaboration and coexistence if we let go of symbolic representations, traditions, heritages, religions, cultures, and all such nonsense. Unfortunately, today, we have a movement, especially in the West, but not only, uh, a reactionary movement back to traditions, back to symbols, back to religion, away from enlightenment, away from science, away from knowledge. We have this reactionary wave, which will drive us into belligerence and war and conflict. So you see a peaceful future in the colonies outside the earth, maybe in the next centuries. But if on our planet, we will, some of us will continue to be um, ready to die for symbols, we will have many other com possible conflicts, many other wars between nations, religions, cultures, Myths. I think it's a cycle. I think it's a cycle. I think there are periods where we are focused on the present and on accomplishing things, and then we collaborate with anyone who's willing to help. And then suddenly there is a reactionary wave. And usually it's about protecting interests. For example, feminism. Women gained a lot, many rights, many powers, a lot of education and so on. And now men are trying to take it back. So of course men are going to use tradition, they're going to use symbols, they're going to use history, they're going to use the past in an attempt to take back or reverse the accomplishments of women. So in any period of transition, in any period of uncertainty, we are likely to default to war and conflict because our only protection from uncertainty is in the imaginary symbols traditions that's our only protection from us that's a great idea i i think this is this is a issue now if you can apply it easily to israel israel there's a lot of uncertainty now about the identity of the state about the what it is to be in israel about the ju the judicial system about the balance between executive and judiciary about about and about and about and about about everything literally about your own life can you buy an apartment you can't. Israel is the most expensive place in the world now. Fact. So, a lot of economic uncertainty. In periods of uncertainty, you revert to religion, to symbolism, to tradition. to, And then, this provokes somehow aggressive, violent, primitive, atavistic instincts. I'm not quite sure what is the connection, but I know there is a connection. Because where there are, there's no tradition and no history, like Antarctica, like the moon, like the space station, like science, no tradition in history and science. You know what is science based on? No past. And no nation, no specific nation. Science no nation, no organizing principle, everyone. no nation, no tradition, no religion, no, and no past. It's very important. Science is no past. You don't say, for example, I am never going to accept Albert Einstein because I have Newton, you know? There's no past. Albert Einstein came, we threw, threw Newton to the garbage. We don't have an adherence to the past. We don't have loyalty to the past. We live in the present in science, 100% in the present. What's the latest? What's the latest discovery? What's the latest theory? We don't care about the past. So, of course, Russians... Ukrainians, uh, Israelis, and Palestinians are working in perfect harmony in science. Even to some extent in media, you know, I'm a columnist in Brussels Morning. The managing editor of Brussels Morning and my direct boss, so to speak, he's a Palestinian from Gaza. I never had any problem with that. I'm an Israeli. We are working together. We are covering the news. What is news? Present. We're covering the news. We are focused on the present and in producing something for the benefit of everyone. We don't care about 1948 and the Nakba, <laughs> the disaster. We don't care about this. It's not that we don't care. 
it doesn't enter our interactions. It's not a component in our interaction. And I'm in perfect relationship with him. We've never had any, any hint of aggression or anger or is about to visit me shortly. So, you know. Dear Sam, it was an amazing uh, talking with you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. There are some, there are many very strong ideas. Thank you. Um, uh, I will uh, edit for tomorrow, a, a sh let's say a short clip, five, seven, eight, up, up to, to 10 you. minutes. Up to. And I will uh, publish it in, the, in Music Romania as a, um, as an article, and then I will edit the whole uh, interview. Of course, I will cut a small uh, seconds, few seconds. As you should. As you are, should. <laughs> as you yeah, should. Which are, uh, yeah, but um, the your discourse, your ideas will remain for the full. Uh, Thank you. I'm sure. I, I saw your work previously. I know. Okay. Uh, and just let uh, me know. You can also, you can also publish. Uh, you yes, record. Just let me know when. Let me know yeah, when I can publish. I will uh, I will send you the edited interview because it will be better. Okay. And I have some. I will include some uh, small tricks because editing clips is a work in itself. Of course. And it so has... I will wait. I will wait for your input, and once you provide me with the file, I will upload it to my channel. Yeah. Uh, I will add uh, also uh, just an idea. Uh, from my perspective, I'm not sure. Maybe I'm wrong. That's it. In the in the world of ideas, anyone can be wrong. But my perspective, my my approach, my understanding, let's say, of uh, democracy, um, uh, um, may uh, uh, make me makes me to think that the the oxygen, uh, the the Western countries are not in decline. Why? Why? Of course, there are a lot of bad things, a lot of weak governments, stupid governments, stupid politicians, and so on. A lot of economical issues. There is a growing, China is a uh, growing uh, uh, economy, and India and other uh, countries which are not Western countries. Yeah. But, 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 there is a but, important but. I think that in democracy, in democracies, there are some historical tools that can, uh, when there are something bad, because we have free speech, we have um, political debates, we have a lot of debates in society, we can somehow, when we see that there is a kind of a decline, it might be, of course, but uh, we can free uh, talk about it and maybe to find new solutions, new ways to replace the bad things. To, and that's why I think that in democracies we have the tools to solve maybe not of maybe not all of our problems, but most of them. We we have tools for the for this. Uh, and in uh, tyrannies, because China, of course, it has a growing economy, yeah. but it is a dictatorship. Yeah. So uh, when China will face some strong crisis, because it is a dictatorship, it doesn't have the same tools to solve the problem. And maybe someday we will see the tyranny of China falling down because some of because something might happen there, like Tiananmen Square in 1989 or other things. Future is open to anything. Yeah, uh, that's, that's I, agree why. With you. I agree with you that within democracy, there are regenerative tools, tools yes. to regenerate. Yes, but, yes, this is the word. Very good when, word. I was saying, when I was saying the West is in decline, I didn't mean that democracy was a defunct model. I think democracy is the best model we have. Um, what I meant is there is no longer consensus about democracy. I think there is there are serious challenges to how desirable democracy is, because people mistakenly identify democracy, misidentify democracy with institutions. 
True. Many institutions can and do fail, even in democracy, of course. Yes. But democracy itself is a tool to replace failing institutions with more successful ones. Yes. That is what people don't understand. Not everyone is on your level, with all due modesty, <laughs> my level. People are not on that level. People misidentify. If the police is wrong, if the police is killing black people disproportionately, it's the fault of democracy. So they misidentify the institutions with a process for selecting institutions. So, and they, they throw the, the bath with the baby, with yeah. the bathroom, with the building, with the city. They throw everything. You know? yeah. They don't want anything. But that's why it's important to talk, to openly talk about the, our crisis and our problems. And I see the democracy as a perpetual crisis because uh, in democracy, people are not satisfied. People are usually unsatisfied with their governments, with the economy, with other issues. But having these uh, regenerative tools, speaking, talking, being involved in politics, in civil society, in the media and so on, uh, social media and so on, YouTube, uh, yeah. Facebook, uh, TikTok and so on, we have a, you, we have a continuous debate about a lot of things, having these debates uh, allow us to solve at least some of the problems. Maybe not immediately, maybe it will take some time, but um, uh, a lot of people are involved in this huge dialogue and uh, somehow we can regenerate our democracies. Of course, letting some things going away and die or being becoming marginal in the society, some traditions, some old ways of thinking, but in the same time, we have the chance to regenerate ourselves. Of course, sometimes there are some sacrifice, sometimes there are uh, some governments take bad decisions, it's true. Democracy doesn't guarantee that all of the governments will take the best decisions for the people, no. Um, but uh, we still have tools. In uh, tyrannies, we do not have tools. Yes, I think I think uh, tyrannies will always implode, implode yes. ultimately. I think China's economy, for example, is about to implode. Tyrannies will always implode, but we have reached a, a point in in. Western civilization with experiment in liberal democracy, where I think liberal democracy is identified with elitism. It's something imposed by progressives. It's anti-traditional. It's uh, woke, woke. It's so, I think substantial majorities in Western democracies regard democracy as an imposition. Ironically, they regard democracy as a form of tyranny, a tyranny of the elites. They also regard democracy as a charade. They think it's, a, it's bullshit. It's, you know, all this voting and so on, it's intended to anesthetize the people. It's not real. The real power doesn't rely, doesn't, is not embedded in the democratic process or you know, institutions such as Congress and so on. The real power is with businessmen. So people assume plutocracy. They assume that democracy is the puppet of plutocracy, which is the puppet master. That's the real power. That's a real... And they are not very far from the truth, unfortunately. They're f I think it's not true totally, but they're not very far from the truth. So this coalesces into the issue of rebellion and defiance into it's it's a topic which I think we could easily discuss on another interview um, um, or another talk. I, I think it's yeah. um, it's a fascinating topic, the future of, of democracy. And why you think it's resilient and it has inbuilt self-correcting mechanisms. And I think actually that the consensus regarding democracy has broken to that extent that democracy is no longer 
a viable organizational principle and must be replaced, not necessarily by tyranny, but must be replaced. So, for example, if you talk better to, democracy, uh, with you, a talk better to, you talk to anarchists, you talk to anarchists, they will tell you that anarchy is the solution. Yeah. And when I say anarchy, I'm also talking about techno anarchists, people who say that technology should take over as a decision making process rather than democracy. Yeah, but that that uh, that is not uh, democracy; it's tyranny, because uh, the, the 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 tyrannies are based on the idea that somehow there is a best solution for all of the problems. Democracy says no; there is not no uh, best solution. There are uh, many ways of thinking. I don't think people are invested in solutions. People are stuck in a stage which we call in psychology rumination. They are much more focused on problems than on solutions. True. This is a grievance-based society, grievance-based culture. The main thing people want is to air grievances, to acquire the status of a victim, and then to leverage their victimhood to obtain special rights and special entitlements. True. This has nothing to do anymore with the political process. This True. is a power play. Yeah. Power play. Wherever you have a power play, you end with a dictatorship. Yes. Democracy is not about power at all. It's exactly like sex and rape. Rape is about power, not about sex. True. So, and democracy is about sex, not about power. <laughs> uh, about a consensual sex. Yes, consensual sex, not about power. Yes. And so people in the people in especially in the United States, for example, United Kingdom, they confuse things. They think that the only form of sex is raping. And now the question will be who will rape who? Who will have more power over the others? Yes, who will rape who? Yeah. That's a question. So there's a reallocation of the capacity to rape. That's how they see the political game nowadays and they, it's, the, the it's grievances it's a crisis it's a crisis of a, of the democracy and there are many moments when we saw that democracy is in a crisis let's say brexit brexit was a epiphenomenon of this crisis trump was also a, a, an example i don't of know why you say was <laughs> Was and it might be again. <laughs> Probably will be. Again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, there are some uh, signs that uh, our democracies are uh, going through some crisis. True, but uh, even uh, I might be Ill, ill. Yeah, you might be ill. It's important. It's important to see uh, if we will recover. If the illness will kill us, that's it. But uh, remember Nietzsche, what doesn't kill you, make you stronger. So we'll see. And then, and then he died in a mental asylum, age 40 something. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Uh, these ide uh, his ideas are still alive. And I, think we are neglecting, I think we're neglecting some important elements because of the time constraints. For example, we are neglecting to talk about mer mer meritocracy. Meritocracy, uh, which has been replaced with victimhood. Today, you don't need to accomplish anything. You don't need to achieve anything. You don't need to study. You don't need to work hard. You just need to be a victim. So yeah. get, get rich quick scheme. You know. Victimhood is very crucial because victimhood and democracy are mutually exclusive. Yeah. Now, that, that's a relatively new idea. And I would need to explain it, but I don't want to take over your time now. But if you think about it for a minute, victimhood and democracy can never go together. In democracy, you have to be a fighter, a yes. fighter for uh, your rights, for your legitimate rights, a fighter for a better society, to be a person who is involved in the pros, in this, pro because democracy is a process. It's, it's not dynamic. a, a terminus point. There is not a final point of democracy. Oh, we uh, arrived here and that's all. We do not have nothing else to do. We uh, have nothing else to do. No. Democracy is a continuous process with like a lot science. of science, exactly like science. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Science is but also a dynamic process. Democracy needs 
people who are involved and people who think not only about their own interest, but also to interest of others and to, uh, to find ways to accommodate different kind of interest in society, because otherwise we will have conflicts between different groups. So no, uh, the issue is, I think, even a bit deeper. Yes, you've described perfectly the, the mechanisms of democracy. But I think the issue is about the ethos or the philosophy. Victimhood implies, first of all, that there is someone, a group usually, with malice, malevolent, evil. Victimhood implies that this group of evil people is intentionally causing harm to someone. Yeah. That's victimhood. Otherwise, you're not a victim. Listen, you're not a victim of, I don't know, a hurricane or a virus. You're not a victim of a virus. You can be sick and so on. Vic a virus is not victimizing you. No? But victimhood assumes that part of the electorate, part of the, of the nation, part of the group, part of the collective is illegitimate. Victimhood delegitimizes some of the players, which the democ kind of conspiracy theories. Yes, conspiracy theory is a form of victim, but even legitimate victim, like slavery and so on, assumes that there are there is a segment of the of the population, a segment of civil society that is illegitimate. The minute you say this, you are no longer a democrat. You are no longer democratic. The minute you delegitimize someone. You're no longer democratic. The Nazis delegitimized the Jews. Yeah. Donald Trump, Donald Trump is trying to de delegitimize the Democrats. With the delegitimization precludes democracy. They can't live together. Yeah. In democracy, the number one rule is everyone is legitimate. Everyone and the input of everyone and the feedback of everyone, the contribution of everyone, they're legitimate. You can disagree. You can, you know, be disgusted, you can, it's all okay, but the right to free speech and participation, participatory system is absolute. You cannot say this group should be excluded because they are evil, they are malign, but in victimhood, this is automatic. Someone victimized you, no? That person is a criminal, is, is an abuser, is so... Victimhood on a mass scale, massive scale, implies that there are massive parts of the population that are illegitimate and should not be given the same rights and access as the victims. In short... Cancel culture. So, cancel culture is an example, yes. Yeah. It's a manifestation of this. Yeah. So it, you cannot have victimhood as an organizing principle in democracy. And because victimhood, I think, is becoming the main defining feature of identity politics in the world, I think this precludes the longevity of democracy. I think it will destroy democracy. Is destroying democracy. There will or, be a fight. There will be a fight, Sam. There will be a fight because there will be also some uh, people who have lucidity, who can understand in a deeper way what's going on. And these people, uh, journalists, uh, writers, philosophers, politicians, uh, civil society uh, people, uh, these people can also express their thoughts. And there will be a fight, there will be a, <laughs> between ex different explanations of what's going on. And reason that the people who have strong Arguments, strong reasons, usually on the medium and long term, win. On the short term, yeah, we can have some populists that might win some elections. We might have Trump for a while <laughs> in power. We might have other people like this or cancel culture or woke or uh, uh, people like, like this. But there are also many, many uh, citizens who are on the, let's say, on the center, who are not going to some extremes. Yeah. I wish, I, I, the thing is that victimhood pays. Victimhood is, um, 
victimhood makes you rich, makes you famous, makes you yeah. powerful, yeah. makes you... Victimhood pays, is a paying principle. It's true. And exactly like the citizens of China traded their freedoms for economic prosperity, which is exactly the social contract of China since 1949. So I'm afraid that people people will trade their freedoms for the benefits that victimhood confers. Yes. Victimhood is a great reallocation mechanism, redistribution, redistributive mechanism. Yeah. And it is, victimhood will bribe people. If people have to, because democracy doesn't do this. Democracy does not reallocate resources to a preferred group. True. Democracy can use principles like justice to redistribute income to poor people, for example. But it will never isolate a group, let's say, I don't know, black people or homosexuals, or will never isolate a group and give them all the benefits. That's, that this asymmetry is not typical of democracies at all. Actually, yeah. it's a major sign of incipient authoritarian regimes. Authoritarian regimes identify nomenclatura, they identify a group of people, and they give them all the benefits, like the proletariat in yeah. Russia. So I am, I don't see in history, democracy is a new invention and I don't see where it should derive its resilience from. It's not even a tradition, you know? And many, ex most experiments in, in democracy have failed miserably. Yeah. So I don't know, you know, Weimar and so I don't know exactly yeah. where, yes, but... why to derive this confidence that democracy will prevail. Uh, in this, uh, because I'm, uh, I'm used to doing uh, fights for democracy in my country. I know. In in my country, I usually I'm I'm a part of a small minority, uh, which fights for uh, the main uh, democratic principles against different kind of populism, uh, um, um, authoritarian views, uh, religious fundamentalism, and so on. So I'm used to doing fights, and I think that. You cannot uh, uh, keep uh, democracy alive without fighting. No, you need to fight. I, I'm sorry if I was misunderstood. Yeah. Absolutely, you need to fight all the time. Yeah. And Even if you know that you're going to fail, you need to fight. Absolutely. And I saw in uh, many books 100 years ago, written 100 years ago, or even before, that uh, predicted the fall of the West. So the fall of the West is predicted since the 19th century and it's still alive of course with a lot of problems uh, but it's still alive it, it's the main power the main the, the 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 strongest countries in the world are the democratic countries the highest level of freedom the highest level of uh, uh, prosperity. Uh, uh, you you can find this in the democratic countries, not in the non not in tyrannies. But yeah, there will be a lot of problems, a lot of crises, a lot of misunderstandings, a lot of internal fights. Uh, I'm worried also about Romania now, because uh, we will have elections next year, and there is an extremist party which is growing fast. In in the polls, it has more than twenty percent. And uh, if uh, they will uh, prevail next year, the democracy in Romania will be very strongly uh, threatened. And yeah, but I'm also aware that we have to fight. We have to convince people to go to vote and vote against yeah. this. You have to part. fight all the time. Right? No, no debate there. You have to fight. Yeah. Absolutely have to fight. Another interesting topic for conversation would be the concept of the West. Because you mentioned Spengler, and uh, you know, uh, that's a 19th yeah. century guy. Yeah, 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 yes, yes. And uh, I don't think his West has anything to do with our West. But it's an interesting thing how the concept of West developed and so on. So you see, we have, we have to zoom again and again and again. Let's make a series for our... Yes. why not? Yeah, why not? Because Absolutely. we can have some, conversa some kind of conversations. Let's say at, uh, at about two weeks or three weeks. Yes. Once a month, we, once a month or something. Yeah. yeah.
yeah, once a month, uh, 15 minutes, uh, what do you think about what's going on? What and yeah, we can share ideas and experiences. It's hard, it's hard to find intelligent interlocutors. Yeah. With pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, um firstly I will uh, have a I will take some I leave it to you. Because you 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 yeah. told me some very strong ideas, some okay, very, okay. very strong ideas. I will select some of these strong ideas and I will put them in a clip of five, seven, eight. Sure, sure three. thing. When you release the whole thing and I can upload it to my channel, just let me yeah. know. Yeah. Okay. I will send it to you also. I think I we will... should I think we can include also this last segment that we were talking, this uh, about yeah. democracy and so on. So, so yeah, uh, at the beginning, we, I will cut at the beginning yeah. uh, when I told you, look, we will talk for about a few, few minutes. Yeah. So that part I will, but at the end, even because I said uh, 30 minutes ago, I said, look, Sam, we have to end our discussion. Ah, so <laughs> there were other 30 minutes. Yeah. Of... True. Yeah, we are out of control. Yeah. Out of control. Yes. Not serious. It professional. That, uh, that it's, <laughs> It's our pleasure. We yes, it's both a pleasure. share this pleasure to talk. Uh, with it's a them. pleasure. I will wait for your cue when I can upload to my channel. And yeah. let's have these conversations once a month about various things. You know, yes, I yes. think it could be interesting. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. And maybe, maybe let's uh, think, let's try to do such kind of discussions when I am in Ukraine. Okay. Because I will go to Ukraine. Uh, in November, December, I will be there. I, I'm not sure about the dates, the specific yes. dates, but yeah. we can talk and I can tell you, look, what I've, what I've seen, the alarms, the bombs, and so on. Yeah, yeah. And we can talk about human tragedy, about humanity, yeah. about wars, about... Uh, if, if in Israel the, the war uh, will be long... I think so, yeah. Um, maybe I will go there too. Yeah. Uh, it's a bad situation. Very bad. Yeah. Yeah. 600 civilians, were, you know, most of them civilians, were killed in in a few hours. Yes. Massive, massive massacre. Massive. Yeah. And I've seen uh, that, uh, I, I, I've sent you the link. Yeah, I also. Horrible. The, Horrible. Those people at the musical music festival who were killed, many of them, uh, it's and of course the the Israeli army will retaliate, but in Gaza there are a lot of people, so some civilians will die. Many civilians will die. It's they're yeah. on top of each other. It's the you know it's the highest density uh, area in the world. Yes, higher than Hong Kong. Yes. Highest density is Gaza. So it's not possible for the arm for the Israeli army to go for the Hamas leaders. No, or no. pinpoint no. Uh, without and the Hamas, the Hamas is putting everything inside buildings, residential buildings. Yes. They have no choice. It's not necessarily that they are doing this on purpose. There's, it's no, like, there's no, no other place, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. they're on top of each other. We saw the missiles uh, uh, going up from Gaza uh, behind uh, buildings. Behind yeah, the there's no. Buildings. You've never been there. I've been there. It's. There's no no empty place. No, there's no such thing as an empty place. Yeah, it's all you know buildings on buildings. Not even buildings. People are living in boxes, and you know it's disaster zone, disaster zone. Yeah, this Israel has to, a lot to do with this. So it's an Israeli mistake. But okay, never mind that. Okay, okay Ramos, care, it's good friend. to see you. Take care. Take care. So you know, we'll keep, keep contact. Talk on WhatsApp for yeah. the next uh, steps. Pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.